Hello, and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I'm truly honored to be kicking off this amazing event, um, and I hope I give a nice perspective on how to write a package manager in a weekend, um, you know, so I don't get kicked off myself off the stage. But anyways, I'm Fabrizio, and that's my Twitter handle. I might have time for questions later, but in the meanwhile, you can send their comments, uh, insults, hugs. Um, yeah, you can hire me if you want me to write more bugs in your system. Uh, you can contact me if you want a Haskell or PureScript job. Anything, literally. Um, but first, before we get into package managers, uh, a small prelude about me. So I come from the beautiful island of Sardinia, uh, south there, uh, very south, I guess. Um, and I moved to this beautiful um, land of Finland three years and a half ago for one reason, and that's not sauna, even though that's a good one. Um, and the reason is that Helsinki loves functional programming. Um, oh, so that's why we should have this nice conference ne next year to here. So I, I did my job now. Uh, so I was here last year as well, um, and I was talking about food, and I talked about this doll thing, which is an amazing Indian dish. But today I would like to talk about more you know, known territories. You know, I, I come from Italy, so we talk about spaghetti, right? And, and as programmers, we should all be familiar with spaghetti. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about spaghetti in pure script. So that's the time of the talk in which we have like a nice uh, show of hands up in the air. So who has ever heard of pure script? Okay, that's nice. Huh. Uh, so who has at least tried pure script? Still nice. So who is running pure script in production? <laughs> but see a couple of hands. Nice. OK, all right. <laughs> so I guess I have to do this introduction, right? Uh, so PureScript is a pu purely functional language. If you have done Haskell, you can pick it up in, in like short time. Uh, it is statically strongly typed, meaning that the compiler can give you a lot of assurance about, about things that you want to ensure. Um, and one of these things is that side effects are explicitly typed. So if you're doing side effects, then you're going to have to reflect that in the type of the program. And this helps preventing lots of bugs. Now, PureScript compiles to JavaScript at, as the main backend. Um, and it, like interoperability with JavaScript is very easy. Mm. And it, it does also compile to readable JavaScript, so that's cool. And it has strict evaluation, with, and that's the main difference with Haskell. Now, it has several other backends, so if you want to run it on native code, sure, go ahead. You can compile it to C++, Go, Erlang, Kotlin, and more to come, I guess. Um, so this is how PureScript looks like. And this is the only code we're going to have today. So, so that's cool. Uh, so in here, we declare a module. Then we import a bunch of things. And then we have a function that returns a side effect and returns void in the end. And it just loads, logs a nice plate of spaghetti. Now this code is what you get if you start a new program, a new project with Spago. So this is a talk about PureScript, a talk about package manager. So Hey, I guess this was coming, right? Uh, so the context for this is that I spent the last year writing a new package manager for PureScript, and today it's one of the main ones. And yeah, as you can, as you can imagine, like it did not take a week, and, right? It took one year, uh, and now we should be done, so it's, it's good. Um, but <laughs> I guess this is, a familiar, this is a familiar reaction, right? So like you look at something, and you're like, Ah, uh, you know what? Like this, this looks easy. I could do this in two hours, right? And then it takes like three months, uh, or yeah. But anyways, I, I don't think that's the best picture to picture this talk. This is the best picture. So this is <laughs> this is a famous sketch in a in an Italian movie of these uh, these three comedians, and it goes like this. So these these people have this leg, this wooden leg, and it's a it's a piece of art, and there's this meme around the movie of like, you know, they, they do things and, and make funny things. But then there are characters that just walk to them, look at the thing, and they're like, oh, you know what, my carpenter can do this better with 15 euros. And uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> so uh, yeah, right? The, the package manager are kind of these things that you look at them, you're like, oh, you know, you're just downloading stuff from the internet. But it's like, people then go and write these like, posts on the internet about, oh, please don't write a package manager. It's going to bring suffering to your life and eternal damnation. But there's a trick to avoid this eternal damnation, right? 
But anyways, what is package manager uh, or package management? So let's look at the project, at the, pros, at the problem. Sorry. Uh, so we take a step back. So we win, we want to write software, right? Um, and we do not want to rewrite that HTTP handling library for the nth time, right? So we copy paste it from the previous project, of course. Or we get it on, on a USB stick from a colleague, right? No, we just put that on the internet so everyone can download it and something like this, right? So we just invented libraries, which is is a way to reuse software. So I guess package management is downloading stuff from the internet. And this is where you stop if you want to, to have your nice weekend project. Uh, however, if you want to actually deploy this in production and use it reliably and so on and so on, uh, you have to solve a bunch of problems in here. So like, OK, I have a, a version today uh, of this library, and I want to use a different version tomorrow. So your package manager needs to handle that. Or uh, I downloaded something yesterday. Is this the thing, the same thing if I download it today. So you need a bunch of security features. Uh, so, or like, it, what if your colleague uses Windows and then you know it, it needs to be compatible across across uh, different platforms? Or, well, I have a library and that needs another library and that needs another library. So your your package manager needs to handle all of this, right? And what if your library teacher, depending on it, conflicting versions of things? So. You can see where this is going, right? I, I can see why, why people say that this is suffering a misery. Yes. Uh, however, however, uh, lots of these problems are kind of solved, and like they're fine, I guess. Uh, like there's a solution. You can sit down, implement the thing, and you're done. But today we're going to look at the last two points, and the one in which the ones in which you're supposed to build a tree of dependencies of your project. So if you have a software project, this is, which is the nice box there on the right, and then you need a spaghetti and a pizza in order to run it. And well, to make spaghetti and pizza, you need a tomato at some point, right? So your package manager will need to go and fetch all the things that you need and give them to you and build your thing, right? So a small interlude about semantic versioning. I guess who, who hasn't heard about semantic versioning? OK, that, that's, that's amazing, all right? So, but the, the main thing about semantic versioning here is that we need a way to signal breaking changes versus non-breaking changes. Uh, because you don't want your project to stop working if you, upload, if you up upgrade a dependency, right? Um, so that's the only thing we care about in this, in this case. Oh, so let's make a software project. Our software project depends on libpasta and libpizza. And we declare the versions that we need of these things. And we want exactly the spaghetti in there. That's fine. But we don't care about the version of libpizza. It, it's supposed to work with all of them. All right? So let's go. And if we take libpasta and libpizza in isolation, that's what we see. So libpasta needs version 1.0 of libvegis, which, is, which has this tomato interface. Uh, and libpizza needs version 1.1 of this tomato of this libvegis with tomato interface. Now, when we pull them in our project, the interface is compatible. So we can pick the version 1.1, because it's still compatible. It still has a tomato interface. Um, now, the developers of libvegis uh, thought that a tomato interface was not that functional. So they publish a new version, which is hugely breaking. And they think a, a lettuce API is more functional, more, more, you know, you can do more things, I guess. Um, now. If the developers of Lipizza want to take advantage of this new Lettuce API, because I mean, yeah, let's, let's, let's try this out. And then they publish a new version of Lipizza, which is actually a taco. Uh, and, and we declared in our project that we want any version of Lipizza. So our package manager is going to pick that up. And well, then it's another version of Libvegis, which is not compatible. So this is a big problem, right? And welcome to dependency hell. Uh, <laughs> so this happens when you have conflicting dependencies of dependencies, right? So you have two different packages, in this case, libpasta, libpizza. And they require the same package, libvegis, but at incompatible versions. And this is a universal problem to package managers. Now, this is actually still fine sometimes, um, because there are two ways to pick dependencies or to resolve dependencies when you, when you fetch packages, right? One is to flatten. So you go through all of the dependencies, and you pick one version, and then you build with that. The other is to nest, so you can have as many versions as, as you need of the libraries. Now, 
most package managers do, do, do this thing of flattening. So like Maven, Boer, uh, Go dependency, Go dep, like most package managers, really. So there is something like an algorithm or a human that picks the right set of compatible dependencies. The other way is nesting dependencies, which is what NPM does. So you have this library that needs a version, and then you pick that version, and another library needs another version, and then you pick that version. And now, this is a problem, right? Because what if the spaghetti expose a, a detail of the tomato, and they pass it to the taco? And well, the taco is expecting a lettuce, so this is going to break, right? But Nesting actually works for JavaScript. And the reason is that the JavaScript libraries do not usually pass objects around of, of certain types. Like they pass simple native uh, things like list, string, object. So I guess it works for JavaScript, or like people in practice do not, do not find this problem. So I'm going to say that nesting barely works and only for JavaScript. So if you try this in other languages, uh, you, get, you get pain, right? Uh, this has been tried in Haskell, and this is one of the baffling errors you, you get. So you're trying to have too much to byte strings, but they are a slightly different version of the package, so it doesn't work, right? Uh, so this is why everyone flattens. Ah, by the way, this has been tried in other languages as well, like Elm and PureScript, and it just doesn't work. So yeah, that's why everyone flattens. Um, I'm going to. So I guess we're done. Not really, because flattening is hard. Um, when one reason is that you cannot really handle all of the situations. Like this situation, you can handle only for with nesting. And you need a solver, so an algorithm that actually picks the, the right versions of the dependencies. And this is an NP-complete problem, uh, which means that it's, it's a very hard problem. And it's like like computer science hard problem. Um, and it's equivalent as picking a point in n-dimensional space. Um, and this problem has exponential complexity. So if you have k versions of every dependency and you have n dependencies, then it's like k to the n possibilities, which for a small 32 packages project, uh, just, just as a comparison, our project as work has like 70. Um, you get 4 billion combinations, so your solver would have to go through all of that. Um, and this is a constraint solving problem, and it's, it's a program problem that belongs to linear integer programming. And if, doesn't, if this doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't matter. It, means that, it just means that it's a research problem. It's an open problem. Um, but there are algorithms in literature. So in practice, you can get nice performance. So I guess this is still fine, right? Uh, but then still, you cannot really fix this, right? If you have an inconsistent uh, set, so I'm trying to match the tomato and the, and the lettuce in there, and you cannot really just do that if, if the versions are not compatible. So this is not possible. Another problem that you get with flattening is that the, the boundaries that are defined for libraries might be inaccurate. So let's say that libpasta declares that, OK, I want version 1.0 something of, of libvegis, and then one version 2.0 comes out, it could totally be that libpasta is compatible with the lettuce, but we will never know, because the solver that is not allowed to pick that one, right? Um, yes. So, so how some package managers implement this is to ask humans, right? So you have, you have a smart machine in front, in front of you, right? So you ask it questions. Uh, so you're a developer sitting there, and you're trying to compile the project. And then this solver goes, tries to solve the thing, and then it stops and says, ah. I cannot do this. Help me, human. Uh, pick a dependency for me. Do you want to use Angular 1, 2, or 3? And it's like you're sitting there and like, how am I supposed to know? Right? So, so not the best interface, but I, right? Uh, that's how you fix. Um, however, here's the promised trick. If you have strong enough types, then you can just you know, take whatever packages at whatever version. You compile all of them. You run all the tests to make sure that everything is still fine. If it works, ship it, right? Uh, so in this case, with libpasta and the tomato and the lettuce, we just try to compile the, the spaghetti with the tomato, and it works. And we compile the spaghetti with the lettuce. And if that works, then it works, right? Um, and this approach is called package sets. And it's literally people trying to compile things together, seeing that they work. And then you know, if, if you're a set 
of libraries that you compile gets big enough, then you can just publish that on the internet. And then people can add to that. So they take the set, add an, a library, see that it works, then pull request it somewhere, right? Um, so this is just a collection of packages that are known to work together on the internet. Uh, it's, it's literally a list of packages and a list of versions, and that's it. Um, and these people that compile this thing are usually called curators. And this solution is, is deployed in Haskell and PureScript currently. And it, I mean, it's convenient for languages, right, to have this like, set of libraries that are compatible. And this is, for example, very useful in case of breaking changes uh, by the compiler. So if, if the compiler breaks something, then you can put together a set of versions that are compatible with the new compiler, right? And then you just say to people, hey, if you're using compiler version 4, just use this set. If you're using compiler version 3, use this set. Um, so it's actually useful to make people's life easier and UX nice, and you know, so you don't have to go through eternal pain while you try to compile your project. Now, all of this is known territory, right? Like, I'm not figuring this out. Um, there is a beautiful series of blog posts by Duncan Coates of Well-Typed, and that's from 2014, so five years ago. Uh, well, he was trying to solve the same problem, but in Haskell. And so he went through all of the problems, and here he lists the problems. And you can see that the, the place in which the, this, the space of possibilities and the place in which stuff works is just like the top left there. Everything else is like, ah, stuff, horrible, broke, breakage. So he goes through all of the problems and like, uh, analyzes what's, what's going on, and then comes up with some solutions. Now, what I'm talking about today is this one in the, in the top right. And it's, it's covering quite a nice area, right? It's not covering everything, of course. Like, nothing is a civil bullet. Uh, but there are some, some sensible upsides. Like, uh, you can have easy and reproducible builds because, well, you have a list of versions and that's it. Um, you have a very simple model, like it's a list of packages. There's nothing else. Uh, you do not need to actually bother with like bumping single versions of things. You just bump the set every once in a while and then fix the errors and you're done. Uh, of course, yeah, it's not all roses, right? Uh, so if if you need a dependency that is not in the set, you still need to fit that manually and pick the version by yourself. Uh, so that's the human to the rescue. Um, if you have a solver, then if someone publishes a library like now, then your solver can pick it up like the minute later, right? But if you have a set that's compiled by someone else, then like you have to wait until that gets into the set eventually, right? Uh, and the third problem is that people do not always break the types. So even if if you bump a version and then the types are still compatible and like the thing compiles and passes the test, it might not be that the behavior that you're getting is the same, right? Um, and this is. Let's, uh, let's analyze this problem. So if you release a major version, then people know that stuff is breaking. So like, everything is fine. Like, if, if you break or if you don't break, it doesn't matter. Like, if a major release, people are expecting breakage. Uh, but if you release a minor release, then if there's no breakage, everything is fine. But if, if there's breakage, then, then it's super bad for people, right? Uh, now, in typed languages, you can have this, like, some assurance from the compiler. So if, if you... If you break the types, then some tools are able to pick that up and say to you, hey, you cannot actually publish a minor release here because you're breaking the types. So this is going to be breaking for clients. However, if you break behavior, you cannot really do anything about it because the types, like the, for the compiler, everything is fine. Now, this is not really a solvable problem because in Turing complete languages, the only way to know if the program is behaving the same is to actually run it. Well. But that's it. But I guess the hint here, just, just release major versions, right? Like, whatever. Uh, no, this is not an actual suggestion. It's like, <laughs> so I guess at this point, the question is, are version ranges still useful? I mean, package sets are awesome. I'm, I'm just going to use that. But if you want to use uh, version ranges, they are still useful, right? Because if you, well, it's useful for curators when they put together the new set. Um, and if you need to customize your package set, then you can actually use the, the version ranges. And it's just a complementary approach, right? So if, imagine this like n-dimensional problem that you're trying to solve, like the solver pick, uh, pick like, a cloud of, of points in there when they solve for the versions and like using the package boundaries. Uh, but the package sets is just a point in there that is picked by people. So I mean, it's, it's a complementary approach. 
So now, how did all of this help us, right? Uh, in writing this new package manager. Well, we did not have to implement a solver, so like you save a lot of code. No code is better than code, right? So <laughs> we can have also very little code during the actual package handling. Um, and so we can actually focus on the important stuff, like UX, not, not making yourself hate your life while you try to build your project, right? So yes, there are a bunch of takeaways from this. When in doubt, just release a major version, right? Um, and, and if you're doing semantic changes, just break the types so that other people can look at the change log and see, ah, stuff is breaking. Um, so if you can also use strongly typed languages, so you get all of this assurance for free, right? Um, and use package sets so that you don't have to worry about the solver or picking versions by yourself, right? And also, do not write a package manager, but I guess at this point, who am I to suggest this? Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Do I have time? Yeah. Lovely. There's a question. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you first for this amazing talk. Now I want some pasta. But anyways, um, Spago downloads the versions of the packages you need, but does it also download the PureScript compiler in the right version for the set that you need, or do you have to do that manually? That's a great question. So it does not download the PureScript compiler, because that would, need, that would mean like needing to care about a bunch of other things. I guess we, can, we could implement that eventually. But the thing we have in the package set is that every package set is fixed to a version of the compiler. So if you have a version of the compiler, then you, you will have to use some whatever package set at that version. And if the version of the package set and the compiler do not match, uh, you will get a warning. And, and actually, we do this check in a smart way, meaning that, like, so if you have package set for, uh, or, or let's say if you have a compiler at like 0 0.13, and then you try to use a package set for 0 0.14, then it doesn't work, right? But if you have a compiler at 0 0.13.1, and then you try to use a package man set for 0 0.13.2, I guess it might work. I, like there's a bunch of logic so that like we do this in a semantic versioning compatible thing. Thanks. Hi, Fabrizio. Thanks. It hey. was a great talk. Um, just a uh, at the risk of uh, heresy, do you think life would be easier if we didn't release code so frequently? That's a great question. I, I am in the camp of uh, you should release as quickly as possible. Like, so there, there is a nice uh, blog post by Gabriel Gonzalez on this, on why having frequent releases is, is a very useful thing to do. But in short, uh, if you do many small releases with like, very little code in them, then the upgrade path for people is actually easier rather than having like big version, big version. Then you try to upgrade, and it's like pain. I need to change half of my project, right? That makes sense. OK, we have to move on. OK. Thanks. Let's thank Fabrizio.